Hello, and welcome back to the Simplifiers podcast, where we take topics in business and in life and simplify them. And friends, let's just be real. The world is a bit of a chaotic mess right now. (laughs) And I am actually looking in my crystal ball and predicting that is in fact true because, well, let's be real. Today, the day that we're recording this, September 29th, 2020, some parts of life are a chaotic mess. Here we are post-U.S. presidential election. I have no idea what kind of a world we're living in, but I can imagine it is a bit of a mess. And here's the thing. It's time for us to reclaim our power, embrace our power, and start to change the way we look at work and stop perpetuating overwhelm and burnout. So my special guest today, she's written a book, and I think it is definitely leading us to the right path. Her name is Christine Arilo, and she is the author of Overwhelmed and Over It. She's a transformational leadership advisor, three-time best-selling author, and also the host of the popular podcast, Feminine Power Time. She's a recognized worldwide for her work helping women to make shift happen in the lives they lead, the work they do, and the world they wish to create. So I'd like to welcome to the Simplifiers podcast, Christine Orilo. Hey, Christine. Hey there. Hello, everyone. Good to be with you all. Oh, I'm so excited to dive into this topic because I feel like your book is really starting to help everyone wake up to what is happening in the world. Because the reality is for so many of us, I'm 43 at the time of this recording, um, we've been sold a bad bill of goods as women. And I think a lot of us are starting to wake up to that. Um, What are you noticing? What sparked you to write this book in the first place? Well, I've actually been writing the book for over three years, yeah. and I've been teaching and researching and experimenting on myself and all the women that I work with for over a decade. Yeah. And I think the thing that really catalyzed me about a decade ago was I realized how long we as women had been talking about, I feel so much pressure, I feel so much overwhelm, I'm so tired, I'm so burned out, there's so much to do. Mm-hmm. And after 60 years of being in the workforce, kind of like, you know, like at, a, at a majority level, how is it that we have not figured out work-life balance? Right. How is it that we haven't matched this equation of do be and have it all? And so when I come to big questions like that, For me, instead of just kind of looking at surface level solutions, like here's some more self care tips. Here's how you manage your stress. Right. You know, I'm like, no, I want to get to the root of like what is going on in there that makes it so, as smart as we are, we haven't been able to shift this yet. Yeah. And so I feel like finally, like I was like almost like writing for the future. And now the everything I've been teaching and writing, it's like now is the exact time to put it into pre- into practice. And isn't it funny how that is? Because I also am writing a book at this point. And, you know, sometimes the book writes itself, but then the timing is perfect, you know, perfectly aligned to where people are at and, and what comes forth. And what I thought was really interesting, just on what you just said, was page 44, you're talking about work-life balance and how, first off, the paradigm is is messed up. I mean, like when you put work and over life, work divided by life, work life balance as a design for organizing your life splits you apart at the seams as you tried to hold these two forces together. It's a myth. It's, it's a myth, Mm -hmm. right? It's ridiculous. It is. Um, I don't know. Could we say this It's what one woman said to me when I I taught this at, um, for a uh, house business school, she literally like sc- screamed out of the, of the room. Work-life balance is BS. It's bullshit. Yes. It's like, it's, it's an equation. It's like a Rubik's cube that cannot be solved. Right. And so we've just been going along like, Oh, well, if I just figure out how to find work-life balance and, and then all will be, but it's, it's like an equation that keeps you trapped in an yeah. unsustainable reality. Yeah. And if you think about that, just look, if you put, if you put everyone puts their hand out to the left, like here's work. And then life is over here. That means everything except for work has to fit in to this hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is like your children, your parenting, your money, your health, your enjoyment, your home, like everything. And so that's just like common sense. Like that doesn't make sense. No, at all. It's what's called a duality reality. So duality realities are like good, bad, 
Republican, Democrat, you know, black, white. And what they do is they just, they're like, it's like a tug of war. And in that duality reality, you can't get out of the struggle. Mm -hmm. So you have to create what's called in feminine wisdom, we call it the sacred third, a different, like you have to elevate out of that. And so that's why I, I teach women to that balance is something you feel within, but it's not an equation for managing your life because balance is stillness. Mm -hmm. And I don't know any woman on the planet who has a life that is still. Mm -hmm. We get bursts so of other it. Equations. Yeah. We, we get bursts of it. We, and, you, and you have to have moments of it. Yeah. And you want to feel emotionally balanced in here, but but our lives are much more like an orchestra. They're much more like a symphony. They're much more like, they're dynamic and they're diverse. And that's why even in a lot of the, the work I do with more like kind of what they conscious women entrepreneurs and even in the corporate world, they're like, oh, work-life balance integration now and work-life balance alignment. I'm like, no, scratch the whole work-life thing yeah. completely. And we have to look at a different constellation that actually supports dynamic, diverse lives, which is what we live. And and so let's let's just break it down with the reality of the real risks of women overworking right now. Like talk to us about that. What did you find in your research? There, um, I'm going to take a breath just because, um, every time I get asked this question and one of the driving forces for me to write this book is, um, I've been, I've been teaching and other, I've been teaching women since 2007 when I left my corporate job and a year and a half ago, my first student died mm -hmm. and she was 54 powerhouse, full of energy, full of vitality, yeah. beat cancer twice. And she, um, she had her inner wisdom kept saying to her, and she was, a, she was in pharmaceutical sales and she's like, and her inner wisdom would say to her, if you don't get off the road, you're going to die. Yeah. So when she started working with me, you know, she didn't even have a daily morning practice. She was just, you know, responding like a windsock with no pole. So we, we got her and she couldn't quit her job at the time because she was, you know, supporting her family and two kids. But slowly over the course of two years, we made it so that she could actually leave the corporate setting and she was able to become a consultant and kind of work on the outside. Yeah. And that, um, that got her off the road. And it was, she did, she just like, she just like did so much great to work and she saw her kids graduate from school. And then um, she hit this point where she needed money. And, and she wanted to like be a consultant and she wanted to like, you know, make the workplace a better place to live, but she needed to, she thought, get a job. Mm -hmm. And so she, um, texted me from Dallas. I'll never forget. And said, I just took a job back in big pharma. I have to travel again. And I have 17 people I'll be managing. Two weeks later, she was in the hospital two days with three days before Christmas and three days after Christmas, she died, mm -hmm. um, her heart. Her heart, it was not, it was, it was her heart, not the cancer. I mean, the cancer obviously had weakened her body, yeah. but the pressure that we are feeling as women is very real. And one in three women will die of heart disease. It used to be one in four. Look at the, look at the amount of hypothyroidism, hyper this hormonal imbalances, you know, depression, anxiety, it's all going the wrong way. And it's starting younger and younger and younger and younger. And what's effed up about the whole thing is we're so overwhelmed that we don't, we feel like we can't even stop to pause and be like, uh, this is crazy. Yeah. We just keep assimilating into it and like trying to like keep our heads above the water. And what I'm trying to do with this book, which is much more than a book, it's really, like we said, a way to help women realize we have the power to do things differently, to take a stand and be like, uh, -uh. No, not when we have eight-year-olds who are coming home to their mothers and saying, I have anxiety, can I go on antidepressant med medication? Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's getting younger. Did you even know when you were eight years old what stress was? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't. I mean, you know, and we shouldn't. And so yeah. that's the, yeah, I, I'll just pause there because I'm very, it's, it's beyond self-care. This is about our sustainability as people. And our, our sustainability is linked to the planet's sustainability. So it's not a self-care stress management conversation. 
it's a it's an embracing that how we're living and working as a society isn't working. I, I'm right there with you. I can resonate fully. I mean, I've been a small business owner for 17 years. I have two children under the age of 12, juggling all the things. And it is crippling at times. Um, you know, I think that that's what's interesting about being a small business owner in this day and age, even pre-COVID. Uh, the pace was insane. The the expectation of, you know, immediate response to emails or immediate late night, you know, make magic happen, pull rabbits out of hats because that's what's expected. And that's the base level of life was completely out of balance. And then COVID happened. For some of us and for some of my clients, the bottom dropped out completely, you know, for wedding planners that are listening to this, your entire industry, poof, disappeared overnight, right? The the foundations of what you believe of how business works and how life runs has changed. So my hope uh, is not necessarily that you've gotten all this free time, because I, I don't actually believe that. I don't think a lot of women have gotten free time in the pandemic and lockdown. But I hope that the, the shakeup of the massive Etch-A-Sketch this year has actually helped a lot of us to stop and reflect of like, hey, that was insane. Why are we living like this? Why are we letting uh, our boundaries uh, get run over every single moment? And mm -hmm. can we start to reimagine how we work? What have, what have you seen this year? Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because I've I've been an entrepreneur, social impact entrepreneur now since 2006, and I, I work with a lot of people who are, and a lot of my friends are. And yeah. what I can tell you is, about four years ago, or maybe three years ago, I realized that no matter how much money my company made, it didn't matter if it made more. I just had to keep making more yeah. to be able to pay the staff or to yeah. do the whatever, to pay the taxes. And I just had this like moment. I remember it's like my kind of no more moment. I'm like, how can I have a business, whether it's making 300,000 or 500,000 and watching my friends, they got the, you know, I got the seven figure mark or whatever. And it was like, everybody was just on this, like, I call it the beast. It was like, have to feed the beast. And I would get phone calls pre- COVID from friends who, if you looked at them as entrepreneurs, you would want to model yourself after them. Mm -hmm. and, and there's some superpower I have where women tell me the truth. And so I would get these calls and they would say to me things like, if I keep working this way, Christine, I think I might die. Yeah. I can't keep working this way. Yeah. And that's like a wake up call, right? But we're so we're just like most people, especially as an entrepreneur, I mean, people think, oh, I'll just leave my corporate job or whatever. Entrepreneurs have like 30 to 70 percent more stress <laughs> and like reports of like, I mean, not, we all know this, right? I have far more what I call superwoman sob moments, which are the moments when the pressure is too much and the tears go <laughs> as an entrepreneur than I ever did yeah. um, in, in when I worked in corporate. And, um, you know, I think that is what's happening for us is that, um, and what I, what I, what I meant to do with overwhelmed and over it is really get to the root of what is, what keeps us driving and striving and grinding so hard. Mm -hmm. And the thing about being an entrepreneur is if you don't know what those pieces in, it's all about the heart, those reasons that you work so hard or push so hard that are coming from a lack of enoughness that are coming from your fear that are connected to stuff that happened to you when you were seven, where the, you know, the blanket got pulled out or whatever ideals you have about what success is. Yeah. There's a whole lot of imprinting in our hearts that are is unconsciously driving us to strive and grind. And, and there's also the external stuff, right? Like, let's not, let's be real. Like, the housing prices that have skyrocketed, the education prices that have skyrocketed, the cost of childcare. I mean, like, so there's all this external stuff and yeah. then there's all this internal stuff. So what just happened, I call it the great catalyst of 2020, the, the pandemic, it's like a wake up, shake up. Mm -hmm. And so all the things that are not sustainable in your life, it's like the universe is like 2020 vision, everybody, wake it up. Yeah. And, and I think because I was writing this book, I did a lot of that work a couple years before this all happened. So I had actually 
pared down my business to be as lean as possible instead of like growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm like, of course, I'm watching all my friends and they're growing bigger and they're more revenue and all of this. And my inner mean girl at the time was like, why aren't you growing bigger? You should be growing bigger. And I just kept hearing, no, pare down, yeah. release those expenses, find the leaks, plug the holes. And so when the pandemic hit, I was able to weather it without a huge blow up. I mean, and I, and I said, if you could just stay sustained during this time, you will get an A plus. Yep. Definitely. You stabilize. Get an a plus. It's, yeah. It's not a stabilize. growth year. Stabilize and sustain. And it's, <laughs> it's a growth year in here. Mm-hmm. And then to be able to look around and be like, is this the life design yeah. I actually want? And ask yourself that. I asked myself that about three years ago and I realized the life I was designing because I was designing the beast and living into the beast was like, this is not the life I want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My business should support my life, not the other way around. Yeah. Uh, I, I think you and I are on the same darn wavelength on this because I also just, I call it the golden hamster wheel. You know, you can build a beautiful golden hamster wheel that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, you build a greater team, you get a fancy office. I've had all those things where all of a sudden your monthly operating expense is just so massive that you have to continue to run faster and run faster in it to even sustain it. So I think that you're, you're onto something there. It's more is not better. Uh, hustle and grind the, the bill of goods we've been sold for so many years now is a myth. And I think a lot of people are waking up to that, um, right now. So if we're wanting to reimagine how we work, where do we begin? What's the first step? What needs to change immediately in your mind? I'm going to give you all an equation Mm. that um, I and the women's leadership groups that I run took on about mm, two to three years ago at the same time when I was getting kind of the the guidance to like pare down, pare down. Yeah. So if you think about like the work-life balance, like that's an equation you're running. That's like do be and have it all grow bigger, hit the six figures, the seven figures, like more, more, more grow, grow, grow. Hockey stick growth is what my Canadian mm-hmm. <laughs> clients call it, which I think is is correct. And this was actually one of the reasons I left my corporate job because the whole corporate system is based on have to grow more, have to grow more, have to grow more. And it makes no sense because it, it just doesn't make any sense. Eventually, it just will eat everything up. It's like yeah. an insatiable Pac-Man. <laughs> yes. So the, <laughs> the equation that I am, I feel like it's like Einstein's EMC squared, you know, like he was working, like, well, what is this? And he worked it for years. This is the equation I feel like for those of us who have the courage to do things differently, this is the equation. Do less, receive more, mm. achieve a greater impact. Do less, achieve, wait, do less, receive more, achieve a greater impact. Mm-hmm. And that becomes like the center point around which you run your business and you run your life and you make your decisions and your choices. And at the root of that is sustainability. Self-sustainability is at the core. So like, for example, with this, with this book coming into the world, it's been three years of, of writing it. And really it's a body of work. Yeah. The publishing industry is part of the beast, just like anything else. And so many authors go into debt, a lot of debt, you know, spend $30,000 on a publicist and spend this much money on the, you know, all of this. And it's just like with this hope that if I just, you know, put out in, and they, and right now, I mean, lots of people are, you know, taking on, on debt and some, yeah. some debt can be good, but a lot of debt, not good. Yeah. And I've done that before. That's how I financed my business. And I, and I was so clear. I'm like this book and how I do this must be in this equation, do less, achieve more, or receive more, achieve a greater impact yeah. and no debt, refuse to take on debt. This has to be done sustainably. Yeah. So when you make that stand for yourself, what's happened, it's been crazy, Mary and everyone, the way that people have shown up and like, like, like the exchange, some of it's money, some of it's not like, just like, and it's like, it's and I, but I had to keep coming back to that stand. Mm. And I will tell you all, honestly, I mean, I had little, I had intermingle girl moments. Like, what are you doing? It would just be easier. Just take the $10,000 loan, invest it. It's an investment. Um, and I would like, you know, um, mm, <laughs> no, no debt, yeah. self-sustainability. Yeah. And so I think it's like, you have to take a stand 
for yourself and you have to know what's right for you. Mary, what's right for you is different than what's right for me. So if I try to model my life off you, although I think you and I have lots of things in common and try to do it your way, I'm not going to design a life that's that I love. It's not going to be in alignment with what I'm here to yeah. do. Yeah. So and I I'll think because that's a whole other box. Oh <laughs> no, let's go there because I I this is very intriguing to me right now. I think also 2020 has has woken up a lot of us. Um, no matter where you are in in business, um, we all have mentors, we all have gurus, we all have experts that we look to for advice and and things. But I think that the world as a whole, or maybe it's just me are starting to wake up to the fact that why we are keep striving for the external validation, A, and external answers, B, to all of our internal problems and, and, and struggles. Um, I think that you notice it uh, without naming names, but there are some very big influencers and content creators and gurus and coaches and things like that that are once were on a pedestal and, you know, had perfectly coiffed hair and beautiful Instagram grids. And you just think, man, they have the perfect life and their thing is going to be the answer for my life. And then all of a sudden, 2020 has started to break down those gurus on a pedestal. And I think people are starting to realize that it's not the person that is the answer. They may have tools in their toolbox that will help you, but the ultimate answer is inside. And that's what I got excited about reading your book. It's talking about liberating your life force and, and, and liberating your heart. And, and that's what I want to learn more about from you of what you've learned in your journey of how to do that work. Tell us more. Well, I think it's the, um, I think it's the, um, the operative word is, and it can go all the way back to Socrates and Plato, Mm. know yourself know yourself. Um, you know, I, I was, I was, I was, I had my MBA and I went through the kind of traditional success models of MBA, corporate life, learning all how to do all of that. Then I left that and I became a transformational teacher person and I studied all this stuff and then yeah. all these people. And I was just like, that's when I realized I'm like, this is just, it's the same thing, but different, different thing. It's like all about, you know, money and more and the greed and the, like yeah. all of it. And so I had my own spiritual ego, you know, this is my fourth book. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you my first book, Choosing Me Before We, which came out in 2009. I'll just be really honest with you all. I tried the celebrity model Mm -hmm. when that came out. And so I was working two jobs to basically pay for all the stuff that needed to happen to make that happen, flying around the world, you know, being a country, being on television. And that was the day, that was when I had my first superwoman sob moment, because no matter how much money I did spend, no matter how much, whatever, like it was, I wasn't having it, the impact I wanted mm-hmm. sitting around talking on television about Brad and Anjali and Jennifer Aniston. I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. And I just, I just realized in that moment that I was chasing the need to be recognized. Yeah. Well, I actually sat with my spiritual mentor. So I have a spiritual mentor I've been working with and I call her my spiritual mother. She's been like there for me for over a decade. And it's a lot of the work I do with people too, to really have that reflection. And when my second book came out, I remember I'm like, all right, I'm going to go sit with her before the book comes out. Cause I don't want the ego you know, <laughs> smacked, smacked two by four. And I just sat there and I remember looking at me, she's like, well, Christine, I just have one question. Do you need to be recognized? Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, let me check in with my inner wisdom. And, and of course I got an answer like three seconds. Cause the yogis teach your, if you can access your neutral mind, you will access your truth in nine seconds. But I'm like, oh, let me go deeper. Let me listen, let me listen. And then I just looked at her and I was like, oh, man, like I do, like I do. I need to be recognized. I need to be seen. And it was like, wow, like that's deep. And I was like, okay, I know the work I need to go do now. Yeah. And it wasn't like, making myself bad for it. This is how we, this is how we get the ego into its place. So the soul can lead. This is how we get our lives into soul alignment and heart alignment. And the thing is you got to go in there and Mary, you know, this, you know, I don't, we don't want to go in there. We're like, can't I just figure it all out in my mind, you know? And like, no, that, uh, no, there is like stuff in your heart that is driving you to strive and grind and do things that are not in alignment for you. Mm. And if you don't know your heart, you don't know your heart. I, I don't, 
you know, like you're going to stay stuck in the wheel of suffering. Yeah. And that's going to be what happens. What you're talking about right there just reminded me of a conversation I had recently um, with Bridget Dangle Gaspard. She wrote a book called The Eighth Level. And and that's basically it. It's like why you maybe have set a goal, but then don't actually achieve the goal is because there are some deep rooted things in your heart. You think you might want that thing, but actually there's some other things that are holding you back from achieving that thing. And Oh, it's just so fascinating. And I think a lot of us, we tend to not do that inner work because A, it's scary and it sucks because stuff comes up from it. Um, And then we just go, oh, I'm so busy. I'm just going to, I'll deal with that later. And you push it aside and you shove it under the rug and you keep your schedule in a hamster wheel of busyness. And then you continue to make either poor choices that are tiny that stack up and mount up to something big, right? Yeah, they're the because they're you, you can't see it, mm. so you can't change what you can't see. Yeah, and so so over when when the great catalyst of twenty twenty hit um, us this year, one of the things I did is I actually did a podcast series called Sacred Transformation, mm. and it's if you think about what we're going through right now, you have to kind of think there's three things that's happening for us. If you truly want to be free, if you don't want, if you all don't want to be free. And you want to just stay and burn out and overwhelm and self-sacrifice and keep creating things that keep you feeling like you don't have enough and you don't, you know, all of that. You do that over there. But here's how, how I see what's actually happening right now is that we are we are healing the past. You're healing the past within ourselves, and we are healing the past as a collective. Yeah. So that has that gets to happen. It doesn't have to be like I'm gonna sit on a couch for 10 years and talk about my mommy, right? It's something that it, it's a but there's a much more empowering way, you know, to go into that of like, oh, like what's in there, you know? I, yeah, yeah, I, I want to heal that so that I can be free, and it doesn't have to suck. It can actually be really powerful and empowering and 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 healing. So that's ones so we're doing that, and we're also need to stay stable in the now, right? So it's kind of like those boards, you know, you have the balance board. So we have to stay stable in the now. We have to have a, make sure we have enough money and make sure we have enough, you know, whatever. Sufficiency. Yeah. Sufficiency is sufficient right now. Yeah. And we also are creating the new, the possible. So this reimagining, I and mean, it's a big piece of the work I do of reimagining and redesigning the way we in the world work. Yeah. And some people, so just know this about yourself. Some people, they like to get stuck over here in the healing. I'm just going to heal and just be all in the, you know, the, uh, I'll just go. And they get stuck over there. Some people are like, mm, it's need to survive. You know, mm, and they just, they get stuck here. And other mm. people are like, oh, anything is possible. And they're romping around in possibility land. Mm. But if you're not working all three of those right now, um, and it's not, it doesn't need to be overwhelming. I'm actually just inviting you into your power, which is we are going through a global transformational collective shift that has been told amongst many traditions that's coming for a long time. And the wisdom traditions say the momentum of the ages is behind us. And so that means this time there might be just enough to like get us to a different reality in our own lives as a culture that we can't even see right now. Yeah. But yeah. you and I know it's possible, right? Mary, like we know it's possible. And and I feel it. I feel it in a deep, deep level myself. Um, while I don't have all the answers, I certainly will never claim that. Um, I feel it. And I feel a collective in that oneness. I mean, we've heard of this concept of oneness from various authors and experts and people out in the world. I mean, all sorts of religions and things, and and it keeps coming back to that. I want to know more about your take on it, Um, specifically um, how you tap into your true feminine wisdom to help you make better decisions and also to get connected to that oneness. Um, Talk to me about that. Yeah, so here's the thing about oneness. We can't get to oneness and unity consciousness if we don't actually fix the distortions in power, the masculine distortions and the feminine distortions. And we don't actually embrace and value the feminine. So that's part of what's happening on the planet right now. And so really things like intuition, that's the feminine. 
intellect, the masculine. Most of us not trained in the intuition and 90% of women don't trust their intuition in all parts of their lives. Mm. When push comes to shove, they'll go over here to the rational and the logical. We're not actually trusting that deeper heart wisdom. Mm. And I can go on and on and on. There's so many different ways to look at this, but but it's the the practical part I would say right now is because I don't want to overwhelm you of like, oh, how do I create unity consciousness, <laughs> right? Well, how that starts is with your own life. Like what Gandhi taught, be the change you wish to see, yeah. is not a refrigerator magnet in a journal cover, although it is. It's actually a very specific um, life, life directive, which is why I wrote Overwhelmed and Over It the way that I did. Mm. Say, if we, if we want systemic change, if we want social change, it has to be rooted in personal transformation first. Yeah. So all of that blame and the greed and the anger and the fear you see out there, it lives in here. Mm. And it might feel easier to go out there and, you know, be a renegade. And all of us have a part to play out there, but it's in our own lives, how we are with ourselves, how we are in our, in our families, how we are with the people closest to us. Yeah. And my goal with Overwhelmed and Over It is to give people the language that gives us a deeper level of systemic awareness and self-awareness where we're acting and reacting from distortions Mm. in our relationships, in our work, and then harmonize that power so that we can be the wisest people we are to make decisions that actually lead to sustainability. But you can't do that if you're completely overwhelmed. And you can't do that if you're driven by unconscious imprints. There's a thing for entrepreneurs, it's called the shadow syndrome. And you, you might have talked about this on your podcast before, but it basically a little piece is that whatever shadow is in here, if you're not aware of it, you will put it into your business. Mm, in your heart. So if you are a person, in fact, if you're a person who has, like I had a receiving wound, that was the part that why I always wanted to feel received. And so if, if, and my first, my, my work I've done around self-love and the school I founded called the path of self-love, it had the receiving wound in it. And it had all the women that came to work in that organization had the receiving wound. Mm. So we often felt like no one can see us. No one can see us. Like, why do we have to work so hard? And it wasn't until I was like, holy moly, that receiving wound is in that work because I wrote those books while that wound was still active in me. Right. But all my feminine leadership work and feminine wisdom work, my heart's are, it's whole there. I don't have that receiving wound isn't operating within me anymore. So my business doesn't have the wound in it because the business and those organizations are actually founded from wholeness, not woundedness. So what I hear in what you said there is, I mean, it's not necessarily that the masculine energy is bad. It's, it's, it's learning how to tap into the feminine energy, to listen to your intuition, to trust your intuition equally as much as, you know, the masculine of drive and go and analytics and, and all the things I think, is that what you're saying is a bit of both? Yeah. Well, so a lot of what we call masculine is actually distorted masculine. Mm. So people will be like, you know, hustle and drive and strive. And that's actually distorted masculine. Yeah. So like striving, you want to like, you do, if you are striving, striving is not necessary. <laughs> it's part of the, an overwhelmed and over it is getting people out of this work hard ethos and that I have to strive and grind and hustle. Right. When I teach, um, when I teach power to people when I teach feminine and masculine power, like one of the power spectrum. So this is actually a necklace I have on. Mm. It actually, this is what a power spectrum looks like. It's called the harmonizer. Mm. One side is the feminine, one side is the masculine. And when you, when you're, when you're distorted, you're off the power, you're off the harmonizer. But when you can act from harmonized masculine and feminine power, then you create like a different reality. Mm -hmm. And so for example, feminine power is stillness. Masculine power is swift. Mm. It's not quick. Quick is like that reaction. And this is a lot of why we have too much going on and too much to do because we have all these impulses to do things. And then we follow the impulse. We don't actually go over here to the stillness and actually sit and listen and slow down. We are conditioned to speed up and that's how we operate in business and the world works. But if you don't slow down, and this is a big, this is the, the middle section of the book to actually tap into what's needed 
versus what you want or what seems like a good idea, you're going to be in that quick reactive mode. Swift is different than quick. It's like an owl. An owl sits. It's very active. It's not slip sleeping. It's like watching what it wants. It's listening. And when it sees what it wants, it moves with swiftness towards that. Mm. That's how we're meant to, when we're harmonized in our power, our full power, that's how we operate. We're not like chickens running around the floor looking, where's our stuff? Where's our stuff? We got to go over here. We got to go over here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's the, um, that's part of why we're in overwhelm and burnout because we don't value feminine power and what we think is power is actually distorted. Mm. So powerful. And I know in the book, you know, you talk about uh, having really a conscious mentality of dropping out of your head. Head is that quick fire, like, oh my God, I'm panic, 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 red alert, you know, something's wrong. And you're trying to overthink your way out of a, a crisis or a change or a situation down to your heart and understanding what you feel behind it, but then even dropping deeper into your life force. Define what life force means to you and how that can actually help us make better daily decisions. Mm. Well, everyone just take a breath here with us. Let's just slow it down and just close your eyes for a moment and just take a breath, maybe even an exhale and just intentionally draw all the energy down from your head but even when I like actually touch your heart, it really helps to actually touch your body and your, and your, and your heart. And you also put one hand on your belly. It always, you know, amazes me how weird we are about touching our own bodies, but it's like, if you're not touching your heart, you're not touching your belly, how are you supposed to be in connection with your body and your heart? And just take a moment and imagine yourself like a like a like a like a cell phone or like a um, that has like a battery charge. Mm. And if you were to take a reading of your energy level, which is your life force, your life force is your energy, it's your juice, it's your prana, it's your chi. On a scale from zero to one hundred, how full is your is your energy? How many bars do you have? How much gas is in the tank? Zero to one hundred, with one hundred being full zero empty, and 50 half. And just ask your inner wisdom for a number. And whenever number comes up, I'll give you the scale in a moment. And take a deep inhale and exhale. And then just imagine for a moment all the things that you're giving to right now in your life. All the things, the people the projects, the dreams, the desires, the responsibilities, all of the withdrawals, if you were like a, you know, that are coming out of your life force, that are going out there. Hmm. And then just sense into, not like sense into the deposits that you're receiving. Where are you receiving from? What's sustaining you? What's supporting you? And just notice if these two things are in harmony, the giving and receiving, or if there's an imbalance of how much you're giving to how much you're receiving. Mm. And then just slow it down one more notch. Really go within and ask the question, what do I need to receive today? What do you need to receive, love, to, 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 to charge up that energy, to receive and fill your tank up so that you're, you're giving not from a deficit, so that you're not giving from your reserves, but you're, you're giving from a really healthy amount of life force. What do you need to receive today? Mm. Just let something bubble up or come down. If you're auditory, you might hear it. You might just feel it in your body if you're kinesthetic. And if you're like, I got nothing, it means you haven't been talking to your inner wisdom in your body. So just make something up. Like, what would you love to receive? And then just slowly open your eyes and I'll share. So I have a 71, 71, and I need to receive juicy generosity today. Mm. How about you, Mary? What's your life force at and what do you need to receive? Oof, I would say my life force is probably at like 60% um, right this second. And I really would love to receive a sunset walk tonight. Mm -hmm. 
beautiful day Ooh, okay. today. Yeah. Full Ooh, body chills. And this practice is called the Life Force Check-In and Receiving Practice. Um, I made this practice up in 2012 when my second book came out because I had 25 events to do in four months and I was living like a nomad. And I'm like, if I don't learn how to actually do this differently, I'm not going to make it. And I had just learned about the concept of retaining my energy. So here's how we operate. We operate a lot like give, 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 fill, give, 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 fill. And it's actually supposed to be receive, retain, give. Receive, retain, give. And this practice, I invite you all to do it every morning. It's in the book, and I talk about it on my podcast. It's, I've been doing it ever since 2012, so like for a long time. And all you do is you check in on that life force level. If you're below a 50, you're serving from your reserves. Mm. If you're a 75 and more and you give and you don't receive that day, you're kind of you're going to be okay. You won't go into your reserves. But as soon as you start serving from your reserve, that's when you start to get crabby and the emotional and the mental burnout types of things start to happen. If you're below a 30, you're in physical burnout and the physical and the, 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 the disease is, is, you know, already starting to set into your body. So the, the idea is to not get so low that you drain yourself mm. Has you know, like, I wish I could get sick just so I could rest, you know, it's like, we don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. So this is how this helps you understand, just like you look at your bank account to understand where your money is at. This is like your, res- your, your life force is your resource and you want to protect that. And then that question, what do I need to receive today? It's never a seven day trip to Tahiti. Mm -hmm. It's always something like have the walk for me, juicy generosity. So now you go into your day and you design your day that way. Or like for me today, I was being crabby about some stuff this morning. And and my partner says to me, he's like, remember that saying, Christine, you need to give what you want to receive. And I was like, I know, um, so, <laughs> yes. you know, cause that, that yeah. crabbiness was draining my energy and my life force. And so I was able to take that and be like, all oh, right, in the moment when you start to feel the drain or the crabbiness or the overwhelm, you're like, what was that thing I needed to receive again? And what I, and I, the book is full of these practices. I teach these practices and what I just want to say to, and many people have lots of practices, but I want to just say to everybody, don't dismiss the simplicity for a lack of significance. Yes. It is these small shifts on how we start our day and how we end our day. I call it the bookend, the first hour, the last hour. If that's all you change, you will see a significant change in your life. Mm. Um, so I give you the practice. Yes. You know, you have, all you have to do is practice it. And I love it. And I, I encourage you, if you're listening, wherever you are in the world, if that passed you by and you were driving in the car, go back and re-listen to that and play it either tonight or when you get a moment to, to do that. I think it, it really is worth giving yourself that gift to pause and take a breath and tap into your deep inner intuition for sure. So what would you recommend then at the end of the day, doing the same, or is there a different practice for the end of the day to sort of bookend um, what might have been a, a crazy stressful day or moment? Yeah, so the, the just like, so bookending your day is how you start your day and how you end your day. The last hour of your day basically determines the next, how you're going to wake up and feel in the morning. I call it downshifting. So you want to downshift. You want to have practices that you do that downshift you. And the truth is if you don't have things you do in that last hour, most people choose things that sabotage them. Mm -hmm. So whatever you put into your body, your mind, your being yourself, just remember this goes to bed with you. Mm -hmm. So if you're on the Facebook, you're on the social media, all those people go into bed with you. You watch a dramatic movie, they're going to bed with you. You eat chocolate, (laughs) that sugar's going to bed with you, you know? And so Um, so about an hour before you go to sleep, you want to have, you want to have things that sustain you instead of drain you. Mm -hmm. And so I would start by just noticing what you're doing. This is not about doing more. It's about doing things differently. Mm -hmm. So notice as you're making your choices and everything, this is all about choices, small choices we make that have significant impact. Mm -hmm. And so notice, ask yourself, is this draining me? Is this sustaining me? And we all have them. I mean, we all have the self-sabotagers. I have them. I just happen to know what they are. And one of my favorite things to do, I'll share just two things is at, so I, at nine o'clock around nine o'clock, I, um, I, I turn all the lights, like the overhead lights go off. So you have just, so you're not, that light isn't streaming in. I have a special, I change my clothes. So I'm telling my body, Hey, 
this is the shift. Like we're, we're down shifting yeah. now. And I have a, I have a music track that I like to play like different types of music and that music sets your field. Mm. It sets the field in your home. And so music and sound and, or like I have different a line of oils that I use that I put on my body. Like I, I'm, yogis teach to put oil on the bottom of your feet before you go to sleep and just having the smell. So the smell and the sound in the other clothes, like those little things and then for people who are parents, what I found with my with my students who are parents, they just teach, they start teaching their children this. Mm-hmm. And the children will go right along with it. I mean, you'd be like, or they'll just self-opt out and put themselves in their room if they're teenagers. <laughs> but like, like they really, like, I keep saying to women, remember, you're the matriarch of your house. Yeah. Like, who, what are you waiting for? You yeah. know, it's you like, set you don't the need, tone. You, that's your power. Like this is your, yeah, it's, you have the power to set the tone and mm. there's going to be resistance at first, but. I've heard story after story after story of mother, whether the child was two or, you know, 22, that they made it a game or they made, they, they were teaching them and they or something they did together, how it just became this, it shifted their whole family dynamic. Mm. Um, well, and I and, think that there is some truth to this because, I mean, I think about when my kiddos, they're 11 and 12 now, um, when they were little bitty, we did the same exact things. The going to bed routine was bringing the lights down, you know, a lavender uh, bath at night, nice and warm and cozy, snuggle down, read books. I mean, we did all of that stuff. And it's interesting to think that we forget to do that stuff for ourselves. You know, we forget to bring that mothering energy to ourselves into our own personal lives. Um, and I think you're right. I think that there is some power to that. And, and I challenge anyone that's listening right now to give it a go tonight and just see what, what it feels like. And you go, oh, yeah, I remember this. And, and, and bring that sense of calming and, as you say, like downshifting to, to your reality and see what changes. Christy, I feel like I could talk to you all day long and I, I'm sadly, I need to wrap up. Um, but I, okay. I highly recommend if you guys are curious about this, if you are feeling crispy around the edges, um, go check out this book. It's called overwhelmed and over it. Embrace your power to stay centered and sustained in a chaotic world. It's in book stores online or in your local bookshop, wherever you are in the world. So you can find it now. Also, um, I'll put the link in the show notes at the simplifiers to find Christine's website and all of her social media accounts as well, so that you can get connected with her and the work that she's doing out in the world. Um, and, and it's incredible. So Christine, I have just a few questions for you as we wrap up this conversation um, that I'd like to ask everyone. First off, what's one book or blog that you're reading these days that's either inspiring you or poking holes and challenging your belief system? Hmm. So um, I'm going to share a different book than the one that I was going to read because I feel like what um, I feel like what we need right now is. Um, just like deep grounded wisdom that soothes our soul. Mm. And it also opens us up. And this is something that's actually part of my downshifting practice right now. So I, um, um, so I like to read books by, um, by more esoteric teachers mm. that, um, that, are, that they're not really concerned with their social media um, <laughs> accounts. They're like, you know, and, and, and this person, um, his name is John O'Donohue and he's actually no longer here on the physical planet, mm. but he's a Celtic um, mystic and he actually was a Catholic priest for some time. And he's from Ireland originally and his words are like butter. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're so he's, he's, he, the, the wisdom that comes through him is, is truthful and medicine for the soul. And he has a couple books. His most famous book was called Anamkara and Anamkara is the Celtic word for um, home and feeling at home and belonging. Mm-hmm. And so that book, Anamkara, and I'm currently rereading eternal echoes which is the one that I'm reading right now. And I, and I kind of treat them like oracles where I just pick it up and I, I don't read it front to back. I kind of just open it up and be like, okay, like what are the words I need for today? today yeah. And I'll read it a couple pages. And then I, you know, he, I call him, he's like my Celtic boyfriend. So I, I, in fact, the other night I was in bed <laughs> and I looked over to know I'm like, 
are you jealous of John O'Donohue? And he's like, <laughs> no, I got something over him. I'm still embodied. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. yeah. Well, he has that rogue, when, if you listen to him speak, he has that Irish rogue, you know, voice that's just like, so like, oh. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I've not heard of him and I will link this up in the show notes at the simplifierspodcast.com so people can check that out as well. So tell me, who's one person, somebody you know personally in your network, he just feel is up to brilliant things and if we could shine a spotlight on them and who knows maybe one day we'll have them on the podcast Mm. well what comes to it jumps into my heart is um a woman who's my student and is also an amazing poet and teacher in her own right her name is jennifer bloom or jennifer bloom greenberg and her second book of poetry um, comes out just a couple days before my book comes out. Mm-hmm. And one of Jennifer's superpowers, she's a trained Harvard scholar and does a lot of work in the social world with um, amazing things. And she has a way with words that um, is just, I often read her words like before I start a, um, before I start um, a, a call or end it. And I just think that, um, you know, she's, she's, She's um she has some good words that are again like nice and short and that touch our yeah. our experience as women. Amazing. Well, we'll link her up in the show notes if people want to check her out as well. So I believe gratitude and simplicity go hand in hand. Tell me, what's one thing you're grateful for today? That's one. That's super simple. Um, the, the support that I'm receiving to bring this in book birth this work into the world. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I know is true is that what we want to experience out there in our goals and our achievements, we have to feel it first within ourselves and in our own hearts. Mm. And so my mantra with this book release and this work is I am supported. Mm. Mm-hmm. I just feel like there's all these women around me that are like, you know, like those doulas that are like, just like, we've got you, like we are holding you. And, and it's just like coming through me and to feel that support, which was not always my MO. It's one of my, my former imprints. I'm not supported. I have to do it all on my own. Yeah. It's all up to me. And I, and I, and that's just, it's, it's bare. It's like, it's so faint. It's almost not even in my field. And I've been working that for five years. So to have this experience and be supported, um, and that's how we have to do this. There's no other way. Mm. And so I'm feeling really grateful, um, for that support. A hundred percent. Um, and I can resonate with that on my own journey as an entrepreneur as well. I think we, we have been, again, sold a bill of, of goods that just doesn't make sense anymore. And there is, power and sisterhood and power and community and connection that um, is immeasurable. And I think we as a collective are only just scratching the surface and I'm excited to see what next year brings for us. So again, I encourage you guys go out, check the book out if this is something that piques your interest, overwhelmed and over it. Um, my last question for you today is this, Christine. And again, thank you so much for your time. Someone somewhere is listening to this episode right now and she is a hundred percent overwhelmed. Her energy tank is, you know, close to E. Uh, what is one thing you could just whisper into her ear right now, just to encourage her in this moment? It is not your fault Mm. that this is the current reality that you're experiencing. And all the ways that you are feeling unsupported or like you don't have what you need, those are real. And this can be the catalyst that helps you realize within you, you have the power to do this differently. And it starts with you giving yourself what you need. And really feeling into, not from a place of neediness, not from a place of grasping, not from a place of it'll never happen, not from a place of if a million dollars came and landed on my doorstep, it would all be okay. But really just sensing into what is it that you need, love? What do you need at a heart level? What do you need at a material level? And just acknowledge that. And if tears come, let them come. But instead of falling into a puddle, 
that makes you feel like there's nothing here to lift you up, open up and make this a stand for yourself of no more, no more doing it on my own, no more accepting this reality. And then every day you choose one step at a time to open to receive what you need and to, and to protect that life force and to be at choice of how you give it. And you start by just becoming in relationship to it. Christine, big love for you. Thank you all. Much love, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>